Nice scuba suit. You need a rod, darling? That's not bad. How about a handshake? <laughs> People call me the dog. proposition for you. You're gonna give me your jacket, your helmet, and your motorcycle, and in return, I'm gonna let you keep your hand. Take it! What, no smile? <laughs> you know what, has anybody seen my glasses? I don't even think I can... Mine says you have a cute butt. Hmm? That's weird. Probably should have said you have a cube butt. <laughs> Why is my memo different than everyone else's? Cube butt, cube butt, cube butt, cube butt, cube butt, cube butt. Cube butt. <laughs> From my mural, I was inspired by the death of my grandma. You said mural. <laughs> mural, mural. Disqualified. <laughs> it's pointillism. Each dot is a photo of a citizen of the town. No one cares. At all. <laughs> this isn't music, and it's not worth jeopardizing your life over. Right, Jin? Uh... See, your father agrees. Don't you, don't you dare say no. Um, excuse me, what's the actual f Wouldn't you rather hang with Dad? Oh. Let's get my flashcards. Oh. <laughs> I like these characters. I like him a lot. And why? What makes me like them? Why do I empathize with a man that asked for a smile? Why do I feel bad for a teenage girl that constantly gets bullied for existing? TV Tropes defines this phenomenon as the unpopular popular character. Now this trope covers more than just what I'm talking about, but for this video I'll focus on what I want to talk about, likable characters that were written to be laughed at. Now I won't pretend that liking these characters is a universal phenomenon, a lot of people might not like them. Hell, some find them to be reprehensible. How about a smile for me, huh? Sexual harassment. You what? Sexual harassment. I can't believe this. But what I will say is that the people who cannot fathom the reasons why someone might empathize with these characters are people who are completely tone deaf, similar to the writers who write these characters. Writers often want to create some sort of levity in their writing. For a lot of writers, that is just creating a character that can be easily dumped on without any real moral culpability. Now, reasons for writing these characters could go beyond that. For example, having a running gag throughout your show or creating a main antagonist to your point of view. And some dude on a bike tells her to smile more. Carol steals his bike and drives off. According to the person that made this video, that's not an appropriate thing to do. do, 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 do. Carol Danvers as a character, she wouldn't straight up hurt that person because I don't think that's her, her moral compass. <laughs> but that guy was being a major jerk to her. I got a smile for me, huh? Jerk. I think I gotta get this off my chest. The Don is a jerk. <laughs> so I don't think it's out of her character to steal his bike and then ride off with it. I mean, you're not wrong, <laughs> but you didn't have to say it. Because that's just her way of saying, look, fuck this guy. I'm not gonna drop to his level and be an asshole to him. I'm just gonna be smarter than him. Sometimes my genius is. It's almost frightening. But in all these examples, these characters are nothing more than just laughing stocks that are used and abused, and then discarded at the whim of their writers. For the average person, this seems awfully like abuse. Quite the judgment on my part, but I hope it is understandable at least. I mean, think about it, why do we laugh at Meg? At Jerry, Larry, Terry, and Gary Gergich? Here's a better question, why does anyone laugh at them? Because I don't. 
Not that I'm some sort of all-caring individual, I just don't find the jokes to be that funny. Since we're on these two examples, let's look at other characters in these shows, specifically Peter and Tom Haverford. Just like the two previous examples, they are also comic relief characters. Makes sense in comedies, but their characterization isn't exactly similar. Why do we laugh at Peter? Because he's an absolute buffoon moron whose very existence proves that Charles Darwin was absolutely wrong about his dumb theory. Evolution is fake and gay. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> Go back! I want to be monkey! And Tom is a selfish, self-obsessed, pathetic beta cuck. 60 days, and then she's free to marry Ron Swanson. He's gonna ask her out. He told me. <laughs> He's the person I'm deeply proud to call my friend. <laughs> this girl I really like, and she's still dating someone. Oh, <laughs> it's just God. Been he continuously fails upwards thanks to the people around him who he leans on constantly without any recognition on his part. His ultimate success in life is showcasing just how much of a failure he is. Obviously because people love reading about some nobody who fails constantly. Best selling book my ass. This is one of my favorite pickup strategies. I'm constantly giving one of my keys. So far none of them have shown up. I have been robbed twice. Somebody shot me in the head! I shot Ron Swanson. Why are you taking the blame for this? <sighs> Look, if there's anything I can do to make it sure. up to you. How about you shoot me in the head? Hey, Tom, can I talk to you for a second? Hold on, this is amazing. Now, I need to talk to you now. Okay. Whoa. And whoa, are we finally gonna do this? Ow! I saw you shoot Ron. Okay, for the record, I was gonna come forward. Now that I have been caught. Ron. I have something to say. Hang on a minute, Tom. I'm not done berating Leslie. It wasn't Leslie's fault. She was covering for me because I didn't have a hunting license. I was the one who shot you. You didn't get a license? What kind of moron doesn't get a license? She covered for me, and I'm in the clear. Hey, Tom, can I talk to you for a second? Hold up. This is amazing. Yes. Asshole! You know, when the Chamber of Commerce asked you to introduce me, I was a little worried you would spend the entire time talking about yourself. Which is exactly what you did. I'm sorry. To make it up to you, I'd like to read you the speech now. You know, after the fact, now that it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, that's... that's... my... well, son of a Topanga. One side is laughed at for who they are, the other side is laughed at for what they are. We are shown time and time again why we should be laughing at Peter, and at Tom, and we laugh. Generally, Family Guy is so unfunny. Hold on, hold on, Peter! That's terrible! You sounded like you were strangling a cat. What is it you're gonna do for us today? Why, I'm the funniest guy in Quahog. Okay, good luck. Well, I was. That's how I got revved up to perform. Not to say that Parks and Recreation is some sort of comedic masterpiece. I called shotgun. Everybody heard me. That's what I find problematic in these types of comedies. The character that is wrong at no fault of their own. The character that is ignored for their individuality and instead treated as some sort of culmination of failure and blame, regardless of what they are. And what are Jerry and Meg? Jerry is a pianist. Okay, alright, okay, enough of that racket. <laughs> a painter. Jerry, the nightmare's over, Jerry. We're going back to work. You're not gonna need this anymore! He's a dedicated, caring man who loves the people he works with and would do anything for them. Like when he went all over the country and missed his daughter's birthday to make sure that Leslie's stupid book wasn't with any faults. And even when his services weren't needed anymore, he is made the butt of the joke by having him still go do a job that he doesn't need to do anymore. Here's the thing, I've been all over the state, Indianapolis, Bloomington, Lafayette, Muncie, Gary, all the places you mentioned in the book. And so far... There is not one incorrect fact. I'm going to head to the house, say hey to Gail, wish my daughter a happy belated birthday. It was yesterday, and then I'm going to head back out. Uh, but is there anything I should know? Any new info? Nope. No. You're doing great. Godspeed. Doing what I can. Yep. He just seems so happy. Fuck you, bitch. 
He's a husband to a beautiful wife, which is apparently so shocking to our characters. So, Gail and Jerry... I've thought about it a lot. There's no logical explanation. I asked for Larry's help because he has the most successful marriage of anyone I know to a gorgeous woman. Was it a hypnosis accident or something? Was she a Russian spy and the KGB forced her to marry Jerry? You know, it's a mystery, Ben. Let it go. Yeah, I can't. It keeps me awake at night. <laughs> he has a healthy relationship with his daughters. Compared to how a lot of teenage girls are seen to be rebellious, they are happy to sing with him. At the end of his life, he has a huge family that loves him. And somehow, he's also the guy that is blamed for everything. The fat buffoon that everyone treats as an oaf. Sure, he likes food a little too much, but does that mean you can constantly make fun of a man who has so much to offer to the world around him? Dude even has the largest penis that has ever been seen by this doctor, and doctors see a lot of penises. You're perfectly healthy. That man has the largest penis I have ever seen. That nigga's name is Big Dick Gary. Jerry sacrificed himself to work at a place that mistreated him just so he could provide the best life for his family. Absolute king. He's a kind gentleman, an excellent painter, a good friend, a grateful family man and a reliable person. I totally get why Gail loves him. Can we address how randomly talented Jerry is? He's an insane pianist and artist. Not to mention that he randomly has a perfect family. I always hated how much disrespect he got. Same. I'm so glad they gave Jerry a happy life because the running gag of everyone hating him started to get really old really fast. Also I never understood why Leslie treated him so poorly when it doesn't fit her character at all. The introduction of Jerry's family was a stroke of genius. To show that he has such a great life countering what happens in the office was beautiful. Who wouldn't want to marry Jerry? He's a kind and happy guy and treats his family nice. Not to mention he's packing. I love the scene with Gary talking to the maintenance worker on the phone while he was interim mayor because it shows exactly why he kept getting elected. He speaks to everyone with the utmost kindness and everyone wanted to keep him around. Imagine being married to someone as kind and loving as Gary. His family reveal was one of my favorite twists on this show. The audience laughed at his mishaps, but you couldn't help but feel bad over time. Finding out what he was going home to felt like redemption. What about Meg? While well, she's more of an oaf than Jerry, she is amazing at bird calls. Bitch. She is good at saxophone, was able to play the drums at age one, and is a talented cellist who clearly loves to play. She's also a great bowler. Can you tell that I used the Family Guy wiki because I don't have the patience to sit through this awful and unfunny show. Also I found this short. She's apparently also a great baker, a great basketball player, she qualified for the Winter Olympics, she was a great roller derby player, and a singer. Okay, the continuity of Family Guy is not very um existent, but the point still stands that Meg gets no recognition for how skilled she is, and even if she were to even get any recognition in any given episode, she loses that respect after the credits roll. But here's the catch, these are characters that were written to be the butt of jokes, I know that. Thank you for the comment to increase engagement on my video, but I didn't use these examples not knowing that the writers obviously wrote them to be that way. Regardless of what they do, these two will never get respect by design. It's a running joke in both of these shows, and I understand the point, but it does get frustrating when someone's amazing talents and kindness is used against them time and time again. Like if Parks and Recreation ever expected me to look at these bullies as anything else, that won't happen. Jerry sends a lot of annoying emails, so a while ago I put a filter on all our accounts. Everything from Jerry goes directly to spam. There's three years of nice messages on here. Congratulations on your wedding. I'm rooting for you kids, Jerry. You are a cunt, cunt. I don't care if any of these peoples get a good deal in life, except for Ron, who happens to be the only character that is fair to Jerry. Because Ron is the man! London at night. <laughs> that is very funny. <laughs> Enjoy the fact that your royal overlords are a frail old woman and a tiny baby. Damn crumpet! No, I'm not! No, no, I will hear it! 
There's been a mistake. You've accidentally given me the food that my food eats. Salad is traditionally the first course at a wedding. Is a gerbil marrying a rabbit? But the rest of the cast don't deserve any success in life just because I'm supposed to like them. If they mistreat an innocent, kind, and caring man, then don't expect me to care about their misfortune. This is where Family Guy jumps ahead. At least the characters in Family Guy are supposed to be idiots. They're all morons with no morals or brain cells in the first place. So when they make fun of Meg and punish her for existing, I'm not shocked because these characters themselves are irredeemable idiots. Parks and Rec, on the other hand, wants us to care about its characters as if they are deserving of positivity and non-deserving of their woes. That's not gonna happen! I don't care if Leslie is made fun of and or bullied by her colleagues because she hasn't shown any sort of remorse or recognition for her actions against a person who cares about her. But here's the thing. Although it's often the case that these characters are written to be the butt of the joke, and one method that writers do use is having a perfectly normal, sometimes even good person receive unfair judgment just for existing, there are times where the writers completely miss the ball and create what is supposed to be a joke character that ends up being the one everyone likes. One great example of this is Jin Lee, Mei Lin Lee's father. Father! He is constantly made fun of by the movie, mainly by having his wife be the dismissive person that she is. Even when it is suggested that she spend a bit of time with her husband, her husband, she doesn't even consider this possibility. He is constantly ignored, abused, and made fun of by the movie's characters, even though he is quite literally the only good person in Mei's life. I'm not kidding when I say this, her friends are not even good enough to stop her from well panda pics wouldn't you rather hang with dad oh. let's get my flashcards Jin The dad is the most depressing character in the whole movie. Ironic considering he's the best dad. I thought he was pretty cute. He's my favorite. He's the most neglected character besides Mijin. Every like equals one respect for dad. Come on guys we need 100 respect. The dad is the most depressed and worst treated character in this movie. He's so wholesome but he's underrated. I love him! I feel so bad for the dad in this movie. He is the best character. The scene with mom and dad and May says wouldn't you rather hang out with dad and mom basically says no was really effed up. Then I thought how has their marriage not fallen apart but then I remember neither of them could do any better. Ha. Huh. XD. Yes thank you he was so sad frown. Not gonna lie I wish there was a movie only about the dad. The dad was treated so unfairly in this movie lol. I feel bad for May's dad in this. Her tiger mom is controlling and manipulative. Even May herself is a terrible human being. She blames her friends alongside her mother when they ask her to stand up for them in front of her mother. And why is her father the only good person? Well, because he listens to her. He gives her the only good advice this whole film has, both in text and in meta. Hell, this isn't new. Marvel's Black Widow had the same trope. The Red Guardian, the spiritual father to both Yelena and Nat. He helps them regardless of how long it has been. He helps Yelena give the only good performance in the whole film, which was apparently not the writer's idea. <laughs> My character is fumbling trying to be a father and in the end he fails. She tells him to get out. In the script, he says something and leaves. The Stranger Things star said, I felt, there's gotta be something a little more profound. Well, no fucking shit! He sees the wrongness in his ways, being leaving his daughters behind and giving his life to a cause at the end, and tries to open up to his daughters, even though the film wouldn't allow him, because they're funny. When they came and took you away from me, no cost is worth that. You should only sacrifice yourself. <laughs> Back together again. No, no, I want, I what? I want them to follow their dreams. No, no. Reach for the star. I had no it's idea. Okay, it's okay. I'll go talk to him. I came in here because I didn't want to talk. Okay. Yeah, we just sit. I just sit. The music. Die. Okay, girls, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you, but Natasha, there's something I need you to know. I'm sorry. No more excuses, okay? I gave my life for a cause. You I thought I was being brave. You, you don't have earpiece. <laughs> Who 
Good boy, Alexi. Good boy. You named the pig after me. You don't see the resemblance? <laughs> you are an idiot. Huh? Two seconds, Ariel. You can't defeat me. Why not, you stupid bastard? Why does that keep happening? And it's not gone over my head that both of these examples are father characters, both giving a great scene with either the or one of the main characters, but they don't end up being the most important character to the main character. Nat still relies on her fake mother to give her strength, and her fake mother is in every sense an evil and manipulative person. She gleefully tortures a pig for crying out loud. <laughs> I mean, think of her plan. Hand yourself to the main baddie, hand your sister to the brain surgeons, put me and my bodyguard next to each other in cells I know how to escape. If the bad guys were anywhere near competent, Yelena would have been sedated and stripped of her gear and prepped for surgery immediately. Nat was told to break her face on the desk to stop Drakov's smell mind control thing, which for it to work, she would have knocked herself out at best and at worst killed herself. And Milena would have made it out of there with Alexei to cover her. But Somehow, Alexei is the laughingstock because he cared about his faux daughters in the end? Haha, <laughs> so funny. I can't stop laughing. Please make it stop. Now I know some of you might be thinking that these characters are just characters. It's fine to write them however they are written. What is important is what they are like, not what happens to them. To that I say, SHUT IT! The writers wrote them in these scenarios. The writers chose to make Alexei a joke. The writers chose to make Jin Lee a forgotten and dismissed henpecked husband. You could have given these characters the respect they clearly are owed based on who they are, but no, you had to make the story revolve around their terrible mothers. Why? Why make the joke characters, the father character, a good person if you want me to laugh at them? How can you expect me to laugh at a character that is clearly caring and considerate of their children? Why does this keep on happening? Okay, this topic is for another video. Talking about the dad being a joke trope is a different issue, but it does kind of overlap, and that is why I chose to mention it here. But I think that the most important example is yet to come. The main example that shows the issue of tone deaf writers who never seem to understand their characters, never seem to realize what they are writing, and just try to get the audience to laugh alongside them as if it is the case that their characters are funny. guy the penultimate example my hero and the savior of the internet the first meme of 2020 and honestly quite deservedly so a quick recap new guy was a character in a comic that was written by some artist she Oh, never mind then. They wrote New Guy to be a buffoon idiot in their comic. New Guy is seen in the storyline being a kind and considerate person, criticizing a clearly terrible and unsympathetic person for laughing at PewDiePie for getting robbed. As they trick the character into believing that they will become friends, New Guy is happy at the prospect, but he is then shut down by this amazing punchline. Hell no! <laughs> Now. This spawned a movement. For a brief moment, the internet seemed level-headed, seemed caring and considerate. People were not just using New Guy as their shining beacon of kindness, they were using New Guy as an example to not make fun of the original creator of the comic. That is quite the feat. Inadvertently, this comic artist created the most positive role model for all of us to follow, and his entire kindness and benevolence was born out of their complete misunderstanding of what empathy is. I hope that the comic book artists learned how bad of a person they are compared to the character they wrote. And this, ladies and gents, is the best example of this phenomenon. Now, it's not a very funny comic. That's the understatement of the year. I thought at first that New Guy was supposed to be the main character and that she was supposed to be an antagonist. <laughs> But as it turns out, that might be what you get. She she's the main character, and this comic is supposed to represent new guy 
as Mr. Bad. Very tone deaf. Thank you! To basic social morality. Thank you! New Guy was created to be laughed at. And why? Why was New Guy supposed to be funny? What is funny about him? Is it how fat he is? Is it his unrelenting positivity towards what is clearly an antagonist? Why did the comic book writer even think that New Guy was a laughing stock? I said it earlier and I'll say it again, writers are tone deaf. And now I know I'm not. You really don't hear the difference. One more time. Can you play it for me so I can focus? Okay, which one's higher? A is higher. They don't understand basic human behavior. They don't understand empathy. It is easy to get snuck. Snuck. It is easy to get stuck in your dumb echo chamber and not realize how disconnected you have become from the world around you. When the character is unfairly treated because it's a joke, it's one thing. But when the character becomes the joke because you think that they deserve it, you need to actually assess these situations accurately. I'll give you another example. The Dawn. A small character from Captain Marvel. One that is not really characterized in the film much at all, but a deleted scene that was for some reason released shows what happened. I think it's important to realize why this scene was deleted and then subsequently released. Think about it. Why would it be deleted? Because Captain Marvel is the antagonist in this scene. She attacks an innocent man who asks for a smile in return for his service, offering a ride on his bike, which she obviously needs. After she offers him a handshake, which he is happy to oblige, she threatens permanent bodily harm, ripping his hand off if he doesn't give her his clothes and motorcycle. Sexism. You are just mad at her for being a woman when the Terminator did the same thing. You weren't mad at him. Okay, 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 okay. You need to reassess your position. Really think about it. I'll give you a second. Seriously, you don't see how your position is absolutely ridiculous? Okay, I'll spell it out for you. You do realize that by comparing her actions to a Terminator, a killing machine, you are telling me and everyone that it is fine to compare a woman's action to a single-minded, reprogrammed creature with zero empathy and regret for its actions. A thing which has been designed to inflict nothing but pain is being compared to a woman. Get out of here! Jesus, you're gonna kill that guy! Course, I'm a Terminator. You just can't go around killing people. Why? What do you mean why? Because you can't. Why? Because you just can't, okay? Trust me on this. Why? And sure, the scene was deleted because it was clear that she was being a monster here, but then it was released because people criticized Captain Marvel because just having her steal a bike from a guy that made a joke is absolutely evil as well. No consideration for his situation at all. What if he was financially struggling? What if his bike was a gift from a friend he lost? You don't know anything about this person and you just robbed them because you felt like it? And you're the hero? The Dawn is seen as a martyr for a lot of us because the Dawn is an innocent man who offered to help and showed interest in a woman on the street. What a monster! If you don't want any help and don't want to reciprocate the advances, then I guess robbing and threatening a man is tantamount to walking away? How is the Dawn funny? I know it's supposed to be a joke. It is obviously meant to be a joke. You see how she's towering over him and it's like, ha ha look at this guy groveling at the woman's feet. Why are writers writing this? Well, that should clue you into what is happening here. The writers of these pieces of media did not use an objective metric when measuring how they mistreat their characters in these stories. And these stories create characters we like not because they are the heroes, but because they are mistreated by who is supposed supposed to be the correct person. How is the correct person so wrong in their approaches to kindness, to caring, to being the good person? Why does that happen? Why do our main characters take on the form of the antagonist in the audience's mind? If you ask me, is the writer self-inserting themselves and or their politics into a story? When your character needs several layers of subtext to clear up why mistreating innocent people is the correct approach, you probably should realize as a writer that the audience will not see eye to eye with your judgment call. I don't care if you think that kind and considerate people are funny because you think that kind 
kindness and consideration should be relegated to non-rich, non-straight people. I don't care if you think that a father is funny because somehow a father's role in a relationship with their kids should be secondary to a mother's relationship with her kids. I don't care if you think that a man approaching a woman and asking her to smile is somehow a threat tantamount to murder. You need to understand that as a writer, you are trying to capture some form of understood reality with logic and reason that we all supposedly share. If, as a writer, you find people empathizing with the wrong character, it is your wake-up call. You are truly and utterly disconnected and have finally reached a point where your approach to life is not one that is healthy. People find your character reprehensible because you are reprehensible. Is it autobiographical? Uh, certainly, uh, I mean... All writing is, in my opinion. And if you can't understand how much of a horrible person you are, then I'm sorry to tell you, but you are now far too deep into your hole of selfishness to see the light of common sense. Writers that write characters that way are not at the core functional people who have any sort of redeeming quality. They might appear functional to the outside world, but in private, where they can write what their mind desires, they will show their true colors, and oh man, they are ugly. Obviously, anybody is capable of becoming a good person. Even if you write a bad character that you believe is the hero, you can still be shown the light and as a writer if you are in this position if you have written a hero that everyone hates and if you have written an antagonist that everyone likes you have the perfect roadmap towards a brighter tomorrow listen and stop talking for a bit and you can only be wrong once if you choose to be by the way i'm not a hypocrite tell me if i'm wrong but tell me why i'm wrong Stop being little babies and actually spell it out to me. How many times do I have to say this in my videos until you get it? Just explain to me why I'm wrong. I'm happy to take in and reconsider any and all my positions.